So thank you so much, Ridley. I really appreciate you taking the time to sit down with us and talk about your amazing series. I, it feels like such a long time coming because I really grew up with the series um, and it's been a huge part of my life, just, you know, reading them. Um, and I am so fortunate that I have a few minutes to actually be able to talk with you. So thank you so much. Yes, thank well, you. Scott, that means the world to me. Thank you. I, I've, uh, I've been writing the Disney books for a long time and um, they're just a total love of mine. And, and mm -hmm. I really appreciate my readers. You'll just never know. How much, you know, you write a book, it doesn't do any good if no one reads it. So for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Thank you so much. For sure. So I really was wondering what really gave you the idea for the Kingdom Keepers in the first place? Well, I mean, we could take up the whole segment with that. I'll talk <laughs> I, um, I, I went into the parks as a guest of Disney and they treated me like royalty for no reason at all that I can think of. And um, I was raised to write thank you notes. So I wrote some thank you notes, but then I also felt it important to make some phone calls. And eventually I was connected with the woman who had arranged it, a woman named Wendy Lefcon at Disney Books. And uh, we got talking about why I had, I'd never been to Disney and I, I was in my forties and um, we got talking about why I liked it. And I said, you know, every ride has a beginning, middle and end. It's just, it's so different from the, the places where they're just trying to make you dizzy or throw up, you know? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. And she said, well, that's interesting that you've noticed that. And she explained the whole Imagineer thing and how they write hundred page books about the ride you're on. And, and then that told me why I like to go on them time and time again, because I think they keep changing. Mm -hmm. You see more of the story. So anyway, one thing led to another. And she said, you know, would you ever think about writing for kids? And uh, we have this project we've never been able to solve, which is writing an exciting thriller inside our parks for kids, but nothing bad can happen. And I said, you know, hence it can't be a thriller. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She said, yeah, that's the problem. So I uh, I worked for probably six months, wrote a number of outlines. I wonder where all those are now. But one of them finally included that the kids were holograms. Uh, and because I had been to this seminar and I'd seen this hologram on a guy's desk, you, you can buy these things over the Internet. They're they're kind of like a, a lenticular dish, like a salad bowl. And there's a little pig in the bottom and the pig on top looks absolutely real. It's not like movies make holograms where they're kind of transparent, and weird. Right. This thing just looked like a plastic pig. So I went to pick it up and my fingers went through it and I went, oh, if the kids are holograms, nothing bad can happen to them. The attorneys took about two months to read all this and and they approved it and off we went. That's incredible. That's um, you know, going off of that, just like the the idea of the holograms in your writing, what was your favorite that you got to write for? What book was like the one that really called to you? Oh, Skylar, you're, uh, I mean, it's really like kids. You just. Yeah. Picking like your favorite right child. I was going to oh, say. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, right now. I mean, I'm working on the inheritance books and I'm just totally enthralled and having a blast on those. Mm -hmm. I mean, the most iconic book is the first, I think, because mm -hmm. yeah. I was exploring an unknown realm. Same with when Dave Barry and I wrote Peter and the Star Catchers and we, uh, you know, we didn't know what we were doing. And um, we we actually like the second book, Shadow Thieves, almost better than the first. But the Ooh. first is iconic because you learn about Tinkerbell, you learn about the mermaids, you learn about when he met Captain Hook. And, you know, so it, that's a very difficult question. But right now it's Inheritance 3. That's what I'm working on today. Ooh, that's exciting. That's exciting. I, I love just like going through them and seeing all the old stuff from all the different parks. Um, it must have been so cool just being able to like go there for research and like oh, find man. all of your inspiration to actually write this these yeah. incredible books. Yeah, and that was the tricky part. I mean, I, I explained to Wendy Lefkon that I really write by research um, and that the problem with this whole hologram idea and the parks coming alive when we're all asleep is that I would have to be in there when the parks are asleep. And mm -hmm. she said, well, you know, we just don't do that. We don't allow anybody to do that. There's never been a novelist to do this. Uh, you know, we, we brought we brought in some experts and things, but that's that's a you know, that's a full stop. Mm -hmm. For sure. I said, well, you know, it's just how I work. So I'm sorry. And she called back maybe a month later 
and said, I've got a VIP pass for you. It'll let you into any park around the world for free. And if you call us ahead of time, we'll assign an Imagineer to, to go after hours with you. Um, and you can go on any ride you want. You can talk about it. You can figure it out. So I've done that over 30 times now. Oh wow. my gosh. Yeah. I'm jealous. <laughs> Disney yeah, on, really, on, does, at, Disney really at backs the time on all four of the ships. Yeah. Um, oh. I've been to several of the overseas parks. I've been to Paris three or four times, Hong Kong twice. Wow. Uh, and that's what brought on inheritance. So oh, what's, awesome. what's been your favorite that you've been able to go to? You know, I think now that, because I've, I'm dying to get to Shanghai. I hear it's just unbelievable. Right. Good choice. And yes. I hear nothing but wonderful things, although it's a licensed park mm -hmm. uh, of Disney Sea uh, in Japan. That's mm -hmm. one I really want to get to. And I write about it some, but I work off of video and, right. and I talk to Imagineers and that kind of thing. I always had this idea because I was rereading the third one um, and like the old Kim Possible games that they would have at Epcot. And I was like, dude, you could totally put in like instead to switch out the Kingdom Keepers as you're battling with the villain. That would be so cool to have Do like you know your IP in we the got farm. To that, Skylar? Oh. Really? Are you picking at my scabs? Yeah, I'm so sorry. Ago, I mean, it must be a, a decade or even longer, 12 years ago. They knew they were going to switch out Kim Possible. Mm -hmm. And um, they were talking to me about what is now happening, this huge Epcot revival right. and right. rebuild and additions and all of that. Right. And at the time, my stuff was popular enough that that I said, let's let's take over the Kim Possible mm -hmm. thing. And they said, well, yeah, maybe we'd reskin that for you guys. But we also might be able to do a hologram thing in Epcot for you oh know gosh. around the Kingdom Keepers. So I got so amped up, and nothing came of any of it. So, oh. um, and and in fact, they put Phineas and Ferb in there, mm -hmm. understandably, because it was just gigantic at the mm -hmm. time. And I think that's always been the problem with Kingdom Keepers. Is, I mean, we've sold a couple million books, and with those readers, it's unbelievably popular. But it hasn't hit the sort of Percy Jackson numbers mm -hmm. or or things where Disney just automatically knows that's got to be a movie, that's got to be this. We've gotten so close three different times, four different times to having them put it either on the Disney Channel or what is now Freeform. Mm -hmm. um, last year it was Disney Plus. It got to this month last year. Wow. We were absolutely certain it was going to Disney Plus, and they wrote me and said, we're sorry, some stuff has come up and we're not going to oh. do it. The amount of things I would do for a series for Kingdom Keepers oh. is insane. Yeah, I've just been dying for it. I think, you know, I just hope it happens before, while mm. I'm still around, you know. I yeah. think it will happen. I just think it's really taking its time. Yeah. I had a really interesting idea. If there was one word that you could use to encapsulate the book series, what would you use? Like, if you had to convince our readers, like, pick up the book so we can make this series happen. Yeah immersive immersive oh i love That's that a good one i definitely would agree with that i i hope you know we have with 50 of those millions of people who buy kingdom keepers books 50 percent are adults mm. and, interesting. And, interesting and the emails i get from them have to do with being able to get behind the rides and inside mm. the park mm. at an hour they never get to go it's and and they're just the books just put them there so mm -hmm. um i i certainly get I get hundreds, if not thousands of emails from, from younger readers the same way. So I would say immersive. That's, that's why I started reading them as a kid. Cause I was uh, raised in Philadelphia, very far away yeah. from any Disney park. And, but my grandma lived here, was a big fan. And I just wanted to feel like I was at Disney for a little while. So my mom was like, here are these books. Why don't you read them? And that's how people who don't necessarily live close to a park can feel really connected to that. So that's a really yeah, great yeah. way to we can convince the audience yeah. to to pick it up. Like if you're having that Disney nostalgia or if you're missing right. being there, that's a great way to do that. That's a lot of it is the mm -hmm. nostalgia. Yeah. Yeah. Has have there been any, any like more ideas that you've had since wrapping the original like seven books that you would have like wanted to explore more of or any like well, other villains or characters that you're like, this would have been really cool to see as well. Well, I mean, I, I'm still going, of course. So in, in the Return series, which was three books, um, through the research and the incredible help that Disney Archives gives me with Becky Klein and, and Kevin there, 
um, they had been, uh, one time I was there doing research, Gavin and Becky were telling me about opening day mm. uh, of Disneyland. Oh, and, wow. And the stories were just, I mean, your jaw dropped. It was like, no, no that's not even possible. So mm -hmm. I set three books set there. That's um, incredible. Oh, um, and and with their help, tried to shape it around what really happened at Disneyland on that opening day. And then as time wore on, I, I didn't want to repeat myself and just like change villains or do that. And they were asking me to write more books. And um, I just had this thing where a couple things could sort of converged at once. One was I had always wanted to write about the international parks. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it just because I fell in love with Epcot and I kept coming back to Epcot, Epcot just sort of grabbed me and didn't let me go. And one day I realized, well, you know, all the international sites are in Epcot. All mm -hmm. I need is a portal to go through ah. and and we can go to all these parks. And I adore the Philip Pullman books, the Golden Compass series where he has a knife that cuts it. And I thought, yeah. I'm just going to have a, a space and time thing with Dis with Mickey's wand mm -hmm. hanging on Finn's wall. And then I thought, and it can't be Finn. It's got to be Finn's kid. Mm -hmm. um, D Walt had wanted to build a 40,000 person community around Epcot, mm -hmm. a futuristic community, and he died before it ever happened. And so I, I'm so appreciative to Disney for all they've done for me. I, I wanted to sort of do an homage to that dream. Mm -hmm. So the inheritance books all take place in the future. And that 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 community of 40,000 people exists. And Finn and Willa and Maybeck, everybody lives there with their kids. Mm -hmm. And Finn's kid, Eli, named after um, Walt, takes, shouldn't, but he takes his father's um, epic Mickey's wand off the wall and discovers that it does a lot more than just sit on a wall. And mm -hmm. That's incredible. Around the world and to other and new villains and new experiences. Mm -hmm. oh, I need to get these books now. <laughs> and there's they so much. Are, I actually think um, they're more exciting. I mean, I'm more excited about them than any of the first eight books. Wow. Books. wow. That's exciting. Um, they, be, for one thing, they rely less on the parks. Mm. Um, so you're still in the world of Disney, but there's a lot of action outside the parks. You're in Morocco. You know, you're in all these different countries, uh, Japan a lot. And, and I'm just, I mean, I'm just, I'm having so much fun writing these. <laughs> I'm so we happy need, for you. You need to make people aware of them. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. My final question is, what is some advice that you would give to someone who wants to become an author and wants to get their their work published as well? Sure. So I've, I've taught, I've stopped now, but I taught at the university level for four or five years. And um, what I, what I try to, what I try to take them back to. So what, what I would say is that back in like eighth grade, you learn maybe even seventh, you learn that a story has a beginning, middle and end. And as as your education goes on, that begins to sound so trite and like, yeah, it has a beginning, middle and end. Duh. Well, that's really the hardest part of a story is figuring out the beginning, the middle and end. Mm -hmm. And there are rules to, you know, not laws, but but good guidance rules you can follow for beginning, middle and end. So the first thing is, is an idea is not a story. It's you know, we can all have an idea. I want to send a boy to wizarding school. Okay, <laughs> you know, but how do you make that a compelling story? Mm -hmm. Where's the beginning? Right. Where's the middle? Where's the end? And yet, in a in a big series like that, and like Kingdom Keepers, you have to have a beginning, middle, and end for each book, while you're navigating the beginning, middle, and end of an entire series. Mm -hmm. It becomes almost mathematical and very complicated. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, is don't just jump in because you've got an idea. Figure out, you know, even if you change it later, figure out where could this go. How could this affect the character? Because it's all about character mm -hmm. and what the character learns or loses, wins, hates, loves, accomplishes, fails. It's got to be about the character. And then the last thing is that uh, people will say, you know, well, I just don't have the time to dot, dot, dot. Even my kids and sometimes my wife say this. And it isn't about having time. It's about making time. Mm 
Mm. And as a writer, you must learn to make the time. So whether it's 45 minutes before you go to school or after work, or it's 45 minutes at the end of the day, or it's an hour at lunch and two hours after dinner, you, you have to get in your head that you're going to sit down and do this. At, even if you just stare at the screen, that is writing. But wow. don't get 10 minutes into it and go, oh, I'm going to go play a game of tennis. To heck with mm -hmm. this. Yeah. Or I'm going to get on my video machine. No. You, you put the video machine, you put the phone aside, they're on the other side of the door, you're in some room, you're in your bedroom, wherever you are, and you work. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. If you do that, if you do that, then you get a half page one day and you get two pages another day. And in a month, you look back and go, my gosh, I've got 45 pages and, and I know where I'm going. Mm -hmm. that's gotta feel yeah. so exciting like finishing that book that you've been working on for such like a long time to oh, finally be like God. this is it i'm putting it out for the world to see and i'm hoping so many people will love it because that's yeah, that's gonna be so an, exciting it's an interminable job and there's nothing worse than when you do it no one reads it and you yeah. just go oh <laughs> my gosh you know i just spent five years on this project so it's not without its downs every right. now and then, but 90% of it is ups. It's really, really mm -hmm. fun. And then you get to see all the people around the world who love all the work that you put in. So mm -hmm. it's, that's awesome. Yeah, especially really on this podcast. That. When, I, when I do signings and especially when I do signings at the parks, it's just so rewarding. I mean, we had 700 people or something there in February. Wow. Oh, and, wow. And it was just, you know, it just, it, it, it makes it all worth it because right. it ultimately, it's it's not about money or any of that 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 always varies but it is about making friends and making this community around your work and I, i'm just so lucky to have disney behind me and with me Absolutely. thank you so much for taking the time to sit down oh, with no, us this pleasure. is this has great. been such an incredible uh time of my life being able to be able to speak with you so i i genuinely appreciate you thank you so oh, much no, thank so you. let's do it again, again when the next inheritance comes out i would love to oh, please, anytime thank you thank so you much so ridley much. yeah you take care thank you, too. you.